Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, just like the other times, make sure you think your uh, fork of the two-time repository if you are using that. And then you'll need to pull from git pull from git bash or whatever you're using. And I've already done that, and so I just uh, launched Jupyter Notebook. And this is the uh, notebook we'll be going through today. It is sci-fi comics. And there are a lot of them. So these are the notebooks that will be covered in, uh, or these, will be, these are the topics that will be covered in this notebook. We've got those five. Some of them sort of overlap. And then we've also got a, another couple of topics that are um, we probably won't have time for, and they also are a little more complicated to execute in Python. It's more than just calling a few functions, and they might be less relevant to the work you're doing. So I will include links to examples for these, but I'm not going to go over them in detail. And I may have mentioned before that uh, the purpose is not to teach these topics because there's entire courses for each of these topics and we don't really have time for that in tea time. It's just to teach you how to do them in Python using the available packages and functions. And I might come back to these if there's additional time left over, but it's... Um, unlikely. And there's a few reasons why it's good to do these uh, things in Python, mostly because you're never really going to do any of this by hand with actual large data sets. So Python is good because it's like using a calculator to solve basic math problems, except these are more advanced math problems or scientific problems, but there's more than just that. There's also a number of problems that you cannot solve analytically, like you cannot analytically solve for the inverse of some functions, but you could do it numerically in Python, which uh, there's an example for this. I didn't include it in this notebook. I just did a inverse of a function that we can clearly find the inverse of, but there's uh, I've also included this resource. This is the course I took to learn Python. It's a very good resource for uh, NumPy and SciPy. There's examples for all of these topics and more. They go into significantly more detail than I'll be going into here. If you need more than that, there's also um, labs, which include a pre-lab, which usually contains an example or two. And then the labs are more in-depth examples and. They're not a, they're sort of organized by topic, pretty much in the same order here. And they all have solutions, so you don't actually need to solve it all on your own. You can look up the solutions, say, oh, that's how they did it, and then apply it to whatever you need to learn. And there's also homework and solutions that might have uh, similar topics. These are all physics related, so the examples will likely also be physics related which shouldn't be too much of a stretch from anything you may need these topics for. But yeah, things like uh, finding the inverse of functions that cannot be an analytically solved are covered in the <coughs> And let's start by uh, loading all of the modules and packages that we'll need. And this is also pretty much global, so I included it up here. Most of the, well, shouldn't say most. Some of these we've seen before. We've seen NumPy. We've seen our plotting stuff from uh, last week. All the sci-fi stuff is new. There's interpolation, integration, optimization. We uh, That's something we won't be covering in detail. I'll just give you a link to the example and a function that is pretty useful for almost everything. For optimization. 
uh, linear algebra. And then there's also a nice package called scipy.special, which is a bunch of special functions like the gamma function and other things that you might not find in uh, NumPy. So the first topic we'll start with is interpolation. And from there, it's uh, easy to get nice derivatives. So we're going to be using the uh, interpol scipy.interpolate module. I think there is one in NumPy, but it's more limited. And then there's many ways to do this. There's various methods for interpolation. Uh, one that's very good for small numbers of points is uh, Lagrange interpolation, but uh, this does not work for more than uh, 20 points. So this is where it's or it's a very good idea to look at the documentation to make sure you know what your uh, all your functions are doing. It might take a while to load all these uh, packages. NumPy is pretty big, so it only takes a few seconds. So if we look at interp, you can see there's a bunch of different functions for just about anything you want to do. We're only going to be going into really the one-dimensional splines, but be aware that there's options for almost anything you'll possibly need. And then the first one I mentioned is Lagrange. It's for uh, small numbers of points. It says in the documentation that more than 20 points is a bad idea because um, it's numerically unstable. So with these uh, more complicated functions, it's always a good idea to check the documentation to not only see the syntax, but also see what they do and how they do it. And then there's also interp1d and uh, this long one called interpolated univariate spline. This is where tab completion gets a lot of value <laughs> because all you have to do in uh, IPython is type the i and then it's a capital I. This is the only function with a capital I, probably because it's so long. And then press tab, and it'll immediately come up with uh, this function. See, if I had typed this so far, all I need to do is press tab, and it'll come up with that instead of typing out the 20 something characters for this uh, function. This is the one we'll be using in the demos today. Um, one important thing that you'll need to know about it that I think is also mentioned in the documentation is the uh, X input must be in descending order or bad things will happen, to put it simply. And what the spline does is it essentially creates a function that will work as a model for the data that you give it. So first let's uh, create some data. This is just, uh, we'll use this function a little bit um, we'll also use it for the FFT, uh, so you need to, we might come back to it, but be aware that the periods, it's just adding two signs with periods of uh, 2 pi and 4 pi. So we'll use some of our um, tools we learned in NumPy to make our data real quickly. We'll use a thousand points, we'll use linspace to put that all in an array from 0 to, um, in this case we're going to 4 pi, because that's our later limit, and here's where we tell it how many points. Then we'll just plug that into this function to get our y values. And from this we're going to choose random points from this data, just to get uh, data to make our spline. Because if we give, well, you'll see. So. This just picks uh, random points out of that. It sorts them to make sure they're in ascending order, because remember, uh, this univariate spline function just needs the uh, x values in ascending order. And then it takes the y function to uh, get the y values for that point. So we're doing both of the splines, because we're doing 15 points, so the Lagrange is uh, also appropriate. And then, We'll go ahead and plot this. Most of this should look uh, familiar from, actually all of this should look familiar from the uh, plotting t time. 
So we're going to uh, plot the true curve, which is all the points that I made, a thousand points, just so we can look at what the function looks like. We're also going to plot the uh, points that we selected to make our spline from. Let's go ahead and run this real quick. And we're going to uh, plot the polynomial spline, which is the Lagrange. And then the, uh, this long one here is the uh, cubic spline. So there you can see it fits pretty well. The blue one, it's kind of crowded. If you want to see things better, you could just uh, comment maybe one of these out. As I mentioned last mm -hmm. class, this format is really easy uh, to manipulate if you don't want to see something. Like if I uh, only wanted to compare the cubic spline, I could just comment out the polynomial one. You could see it a little better, although it probably was not the best color choice because it's hard to see on blue. You can go ahead and change that if we want real quick. Let's try yellow. Uh, it's a little better. This is mm -hmm. dot dash. And you can see the cubic spline for these small number of data points doesn't fit quite as well as the uh, higher order polynomial. It fits a little more closely. And obviously as you decrease the number of points that you're using, it might not uh, fit the data very well. See here we don't have any points on the uh, too far on the left or right side because uh, there's mm -hmm. nothing for the spline to go off there. So it just models it as closely as it can. And that comes back to it's an interpolating spline. It's not an extrapolating spline. And uh, the other function that we're not using that's similar to this long one here, interp1d, it does not let you extrapolate, which is not necessarily a bad thing because extrapolating can be dangerous. You can get values that are not realistic because it's following the spline, not necessarily this true curve or whatever uh, is creating your data. Um, the long spline, the interpolated univariate spline, that, uh, that can be extrapolated, so you'll need to be careful with that. The other one will just uh, return an error. So let's put this back to 15 points. And then from here, it's really easy to take the uh, derivative. Um, and one of the reasons why it's nice to take the derivative of the spline rather than the data is your data might be really noisy and the spline helps cut down on that. You could also, there's also smoothing options for the spline that you could pass extra arguments for. So you could uh, add that in there if it needs to be smooth and it's still too noisy. But it's also really easy to um, get the derivative out of the spline. So here we're going to give it a little more point, uh, more points so the derivative actually makes more sense. It's not, it doesn't really make sense to take a derivative of something when you've only got 10 points there, especially if it's uh, something like this. So we can go ahead and do that and showing up. That's probably because it should be here. Did I run this code somewhere? I know I commented some things out here. These are just the uh, points. Mm -hmm. And then this is a second derivative. Because we're using the cubic spline to make the derivative, it uh, doesn't make as much sense because the concavity changes rather predictably because it's using cubic spline for these smaller number of points. And uh, to get the uh, derivative, you just pass it an extra argument here. So I just pass it a 1 for a first derivative, 2 for a second derivative. 
and it should be right on top of, well, not right on top because it's a derivative of this, so it should be slightly offset of period because it's a uh, sines. I'm not sure why this isn't showing up. It was when I tried it uh, not too long ago. Showing up in the legend. Let me try not giving a limit since you don't get the. It's just showing up elsewhere for some reason. Nope. Well, I might come back to that. Let's uh, move on to inverting for now. But anyhow, the main point is to take the derivative. All you need to do is pass it that extra argument, and that'll. Uh, well, you make your spline function here, and then when you call that function, you pass it that extra argument other than your uh, x data. To get the inverse, it's uh, here we're gonna use um, x cubed, or y equals x cubed for our data. And say we want the inverse of that, so that should just be the cube root. So what you do is you just pass it the uh, variables in reverse order. So instead of x comma y, it's y comma x. And then I'll call this the inverse line. So this is a function here. And then when we call that function, we give it y values instead of x. And this should, uh, so we'll plot this against the cube root. Hopefully this one shows up. Oh, I forgot to run in these two cells. Uh, yeah, you can see it better mm -hmm. up there. You can see the dotted green line yeah. is the spline, and it's right on top of the cube, as we would expect. So inverting works pretty well. Granted, I did give it 500 points to interpolate off of in this uh, range from 0 to 2.5. So that's a nice example of how to make an inverse. And then you might want to integrate. There's a number of ways to integrate. There is all sorts of rules you could do, like you could do some sort of trapezoidal integration. Uh, the main workhorse function in Python is uh, quad. And this does, it it's uses a number of techniques. Um, you can go ahead and look at it. So you pass it a function, and then you pass it the limits you want to in integrate between. So the start point and end point and it will return two things. The first is the value of that integral, and the second is the error. So here we're just passing it the numpy cosine function, and we're evaluating between zero and pi over two. So this should give us about one, and see it pretty much gives us one, and the error is almost zero. Um, if your error is not almost zero, you might have a problem using this function, and you should explore that a little more in depth. It's generally not a good practice to ignore this error, just in case it isn't almost zero, but you might just want the first value, in which case you could just do a uh, bracket zero here to get the first index instead of the other one, which I will do later here. So um, this is one of the times where you can't really do array slicing with this function very well. Um, so you have to use loops. So we're going to integrate over the cosine function using quad. So we pass it the function and the limits. And, we're, and this is a loop. So we're starting at uh, 0, which is where our exodus starts. And we're going all the way to pi. And we just defined y as pretty much an empty array because we're replacing the, each of the values. It's an array of zeros, but it doesn't really matter because we're replacing all of them. And we're replacing one with the value of the integral. So the 
Let's go ahead and plot that. And you can see it gives you a nice integral of the cosine. And this is just the uh, general function for integration, just a simple example. And you can see the integral for cosine is sine as we did expect. Uh, these are the two topics that I will not be covering here. Here are some links to examples. And these are the uh, functions you use for them. For each of these, you need to create your own function for your for whatever you want with your uh, differential equations in it. And then it needs to be set up so you can pass it and it'll solve everything for you. Same with curve fitting. Um, this is a very flexible fit. There's also another function called least squares or something in the optimization module that has a similar functionality. It's even more broad than curve fit. The next topic we'll get into is linear algebra. You might have noticed that the array object is sort of set up very conveniently for this. So we'll just uh, show some of the methods for the things you might want to do in linear algebra here. First thing we'll get to is uh, linear systems of equations. So here we've got a system of three equations. You can put this in matrix form to, into the equation ax plus b. And A is just all your coefficients, X is all your variables, and B is, um, well, the, all the values on the right-hand side. And the most straightforward to do this is just the uh, solve function. So you define our arrays here, and then, so this is A, and this is B, and then you pass the solve function A and B, and it'll go ahead and solve it for you, and you can see the values are x1 is 2, x2 is negative 1, and x3 is 1. And that satisfies all the equations. And to uh, verify this, we could just multiply a times x and see that it equals b. Uh, we do not use a star for matrix multiplication. That will multiply them each element by element. We use a function called np dot. NP dot. So, uh, you just put it in the order that you want to multiply. Order matters for matrix mm -hmm. multiplication. And you can see we get the uh, same result, B. And then there's a number of uh, other useful functions that you could do. There's shortcuts, like if you want to transpose of A. Here we had, this is A. Just a little refresher if you want to transpose. It's just uh, instance attribute dot T. That will give you transpose. For the identity matrix, it's np.iEYE. -E. And then just the uh, shape. So this number will be the dimension of the square matrix. So 4 is a 4 by 4. If you want the determinant, that's also very easily be found. Um, you can diagonalize a one dimensional array, just put it all on the diagonal and fill the rest of the two dimensional array with zeros. So here we're just, uh, as an example, I diagonalize this B vector. And then there might be some more complicated things that you want to do, like um, there's PLU factorization. And part of the power in this factorization is uh, it, if you have a large number of things that you need to multiply by the same matrix, you can factor it into this PLU. And what that'll do is it'll essentially make it faster because it uses less memory after it's factored. So there's a couple functions to do that. If you just want to find PL and U, it's just that LA dot LU. Now you input your matrix and then it returns three things in this order. If you look at the documentation, you can see that pretty easily. So let's go ahead and do that on the same matrix. So here's the permutation matrix, the lower triangular, the upper triangular. If we multiply these all out, they would be equal to the matrix A. So doing this by hand can be a pain, so it's nice to have something to do it for you very easily. And then there's also eigenvalue problems, so that's also pretty easy. Um, this uh, 
eigenvalue function is just takes your matrix and it'll give you the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors as the two arguments returned. So if you go ahead and look at that, and you'll notice it gives you a, in a complex notation. It uses the electrical engineering notation of j per square root of negative 1 rather than i. So here are the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. And then last topic we'll quickly cover is uh, singular value decomposition. There's also uh, functions for this. So uh, just la.svd will factor it for you so you can solve it yourself or you could just get the uh, singular values as a solution using SVD vales. And then a couple of useful tools is also the pseudo inverse for some matrices that are not invertible. There's two ways to do this. There's this way, which I'm not sure what method this is. This, and then there's also another inverse function that uh, uses SVD, which means it's faster, but it gives you the same result because they're both the uh, pseudo inverse. And then the last topic we'll be covering here is it's not as uh, complicated as these other topics that I figured we wouldn't have time for, but it's still more than just plug it into a function and gives you your result. So it'll take a little longer to cover. So first we'll create some data. We'll use um, 1,001 points. Um, this, this makes it easier if you have an odd number of points. You'll see why in a second. Then we'll have uh, the time values, just uh, 0 to 24 pi, and then for all these 1,001 points. And then for this will be our amplitude. This is from the function all the way at the top that I told you the uh, periods were uh, 2 pi and so 2 pi for this one and 4 pi here. So when we use the FFT, we could um, find that pretty easily. So we use that function. We'll just multiply it by 10 to give it an amplitude of about 10. And then we'll add a bunch of noise to that because taking an FFT of something that you already know the frequencies of is not terribly useful. So we'll add a bunch of noise to this. It'll be twice the amplitude. It'll be uh, normally distributed noise. So essentially white noise. So we'll go ahead and do that. And we'll add them together to get a sort of a noisy curve. So let's look at this. And here's our signal from before. You may recognize this. It just uh, goes all the way to something like 24 pi, whereas before mm -hmm. we were just looking at 4 pi. So it's repeated, periodic. And then you can see the uh, all the noise in there. So. The noisy signal is all the dots. As you can see, it's by eye, it's pretty much impossible to tell what the dominant frequencies are. That's what the Fourier transform is for. It just you know, puts everything in a frequency domain. Um, there's two functions you use for this. Uh, we're using the NumPy Fourier transform package. There's also a more extensive one in SciPy. But for our case, this just has uh, what we need here. It, gets a little complicated. It would be easier if it just uh, returned uh, your y values and then x in frequency domain. Instead, you need to use both um, functions. The first one, you just use on your amplitude or intensity values here. And then the second one, you use on whatever your number of points is. In this case, it's 1,001. So the FFT gives you the well, FFT and the frequency gives you the frequencies in the same order that correspond to these points. And if we look at those frequencies, you can see it starts at zero frequency. So this is just the uh, DC level of your signal. And then it goes in uh, ascending order to through the positive frequencies and then goes through the negative frequencies. 
So we could use our knowledge of array slicing, or not really array slicing, more array indexing, to pull out the frequencies that we want to see. So um, we want to skip the first one because that's just DC. So we'll start at one, which remember uh, start at zero. So one is the second index. So for a positive, or, well, this is just a tool we'll use for the index. It's integer division because we used an odd number of points. So for a positive number of frequencies, it's easy to, I just uh, plug in this array of values and it'll give me all my positive frequencies. Because negative frequencies are the same number, but from the back side, I just do a negative of that array and it'll give me all my negative frequencies. And then I can do the same thing with the FFT values to get uh, frequencies that for all those FFT values. And here you can see it works. So from there we could go ahead and plot the uh, power spectral density to see what our dominant frequencies are. And we should expect them to be um, 2 pi and 4 pi. Although uh, these frequencies are based on the number of points, so we'll have to convert that in a little bit. Well, these are our dominant wavelengths, not frequencies, so the inverse. So we could go ahead and look at that, and we'll see that all this stuff down here is low level noise, so it doesn't show up very well on the power spectral density. But we got two nice big peaks at uh, where we would expect. This is, um, well, 10 to the 9th, so it's pretty far up there. And it, it keeps going. I just cut it off at 5 so we could actually see what we're looking for. And then we could use the where function, that, which we covered in NumPy, to just find where it's uh, all the peaks that are above a certain threshold. In this case, I might want to lower that a little bit, so because it doesn't look like uh, that peak is over there. I'm not sure if that'll work. Oh, there we go. And we needed, um, so we pull out the uh, frequency from those peaks, because this returns an index, that's what the where function does, if you remember that. And then we just plug that into the frequency, that index. And then to get the uh, wavelength, we have to invert that, of course, and then multiply it, that's the range of pi divided by the number of points, which is what this function does to show frequencies, and we can see it's pretty much exactly four, and exactly two to uh, statistical significance. We do have a little extra time, um, so I might go, let's see if I could figure out what went wrong in the uh, derivative. So here's our splines, and then here's the plot where it should be the derivative. So. This one's plotting just fine. It's the uh, blue one because the default is blue. And then this one's definitely getting past the legend, which is interesting because it's not showing up at all. It should just be the derivative. So here we start out positive, and then it gets to the top, it would approach zero and then negative. So I think I tried turning this out and still didn't see anything. It's not returning any errors. Anyone have any ideas why this isn't? It runs fine on my computer. Oh, even more frustrating. <laughs> well, that actually narrows it down. It probably means that I didn't execute one of these so I could just ah. get on. Yeah, there we go. That your environment isn't. Yeah, I skipped one of the cells somewhere. <laughs> Probably the one with all the data in it that defines this. <laughs> okay, so that explains that. See, there's uh, I added the cubic spline here. It's right on top. And then here's the uh, derivative. So it's pretty nice and smooth. Uh, if this was noisier, obviously it would be less smooth, but if you tried directly taking the derivative from the noisy data, 
it would amplify the noise. So this is a way to get around that. And then the two topics that I said we might uh, cover are differential equations and fitting and optimization. So let's go to this uh, website and I'll just show you the uh, examples. So, let's see. Oh, this is, uh, so he includes uh, NVViewer, which uh, if you go to this link, you could, anything that's uh, available as a URL or in uh, GitHub, mm -hmm. not Bitbucket, just GitHub, you could just put it in here and it will convert it to a format that's sort of like the HTML files I've been opening, or been adding, but it's its own thing called NVViewer, which means you could view the document, but uh, you don't need to have notebook installed, but you can interact with it, obviously. So that's uh, one option. So here's this initialization, same sort of thing. And then he, uh, he's going to do this on the precession of mercury. The, these are more sort of more advanced topics that go into sort of physical examples, which can be hard to understand if you don't have that back, background. And he makes sure he gets it right, so here's all the uh, constants. And then this is what you need to do when you build the function. It needs to take several uh, parameters, and then you need to have... Um, Those are the arguments you're passing in? Yeah. And then you need to have the first derivative and then you need to return the derivative. And then you need to use a ODE int for the differential equation to, and then you pass it the function, the uh, start point, so y0 or y0. Then t is just the uh, range. That'll give you the values. Let's see if he has any nice plots. Yep. So then he plots that, and you can see it does a nice job. So it's a little more complicated to use because you have to build your own function. And um, the syntax with this, conceptually, it's a little bit confusing when you first go to do it. And the other topic that we didn't cover was uh, curve fitting, I believe. Let's see if there's a good example for this one. This might be, yeah, this is uh, fitting data. So mm -hmm. we'll come up with the, some physics equation that he wants to fit uh, using the gamma function. So here's where he defines the function, all this. So this is just a function, and then, let's see, where does he actually call the thing to fit? This is just looking at the function a little bit more, and it's sort of a, here's the true model, and here's the data, so you're gonna fit the data, sort of like I did with the spline. And this is just formatting for the print function. So. The curve fit returns uh, two parameters. There's one of them is the chi squared. Well, you could get the chi squared from p. Yeah, this one's actually a little more complicated because p is a list depending on how many different parameters you're fitting. Curve fit can fit pretty much any number of parameters, and what you can get out of it is uh, the best fit for the parameters and then the error from the uh, chi-squared. Then goodness fit and of course you have your degrees of freedom. There's a chi-squared value that you could um, compute just by squaring the uh, PR units that it passes back. And notice you want to make sure that uh, 
you're doing it at the right frequency, otherwise you'll get something like this. You want it more like here is a good fit. And that's all we have for the uh, sci-fi topics. The next few days I think we'll be mm -hmm. getting into, next time might be Psychid Image with Justin, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then we'll also, Mohammed is gonna show how to execute some Python code in R, and there's a couple other topics I don't remember off the top of my head. Machine learning, scikit learn. Yeah, that's one of them. Cool. Any questions?